Hallelujah. Hey, it's uh, so good to be back with you guys for the second week in a row. If we've never been together before, my name's Timothy Atik, and I'm the director of Breakaway Ministries in College Station. Uh, awesome. It's great. Uh, and so good to be back with you today. I want to start just by sharing with you a story, something that happened uh, the summer uh, after I graduated from college. I found myself in Colorado uh, at uh, Young Life's Wilderness Ranch. And so I was with a group of high school students and we went backpacking in the mountains of Colorado for about a week. And I remember this one point in our journey through the mountains where our guides got us lost. Like we had no sign of the trail anymore. We were just in this uh, opening in the mountainside. We were on the steep incline uh, and as we were on the steep incline, the guides decide that we need to kind of traverse our way down to this lake that's below us. And right in the midst of traversing our way down this hillside or this mountainside, we can, the, the skies kind of opened up and began to pelt us with hail. And so what was a very kind of collected effort to get down the mountain became chaos and it was just every man for himself. So these high school students began to decide on their own what the best way down the mountain was. So there was one guy who just began to somersault down the hill, just end over end. He just thought, this is the most, this is, I'm going to expedite this process and I'm going to get to the bottom. And he reached the bottom pretty quickly, let me add. And then some people just were like, okay, I still need to work this thing back and forth, but I'm going to run it. And then... For me, I was like, I just graduated college. I need to be responsible in my own life. And so I just began to slowly work my way down the mountain. I was like, if God decided he wants to hail on me right now, he has that right to do that. And so I'm just going to take it. But I remember I got to the bottom of the mountain and I look and I see our guides who had become our friends throughout the week and they were motioning us into the shelter. It was the most relieving scene I could ever imagine because as we came off this mountain, here are these friends of ours motioning us in to this makeshift shelter. They had strung up a tarp between trees and so I will never forget the feeling of just stepping under this tarp and out of the hail. And as the storm continued to rage on, our lives in automatically went from chaotic to calm in that moment. And we just stood there and we huddled together and we took shelter even as the storm raged on. And every time I think about that story, I can't help but think about how Psalm 46 portrays God. It portrays God as a shelter. The psalmist says this in Psalm 46, one, it says, God is our refuge or our shelter in strength, a very present help in trouble. And here's the reality, storms are going to hit in life. You're gonna get hailed on in this lifetime. It's not a question of if it's gonna happen, it's just a matter of when. If you're not in a storm now, storms will come at some point. They will roll into your life. Things. Are, there are going to be moments in life where, where your expectations in reality, reality just head in two totally different directions. God never promises to stop the storms, but he most certainly will sustain us through the storms because he loves and delights in being our shelter in the midst of the storms. But I want you to think about this. These friends, these guides that have become friends over the week, they played a key role in us experiencing shelter in that moment. These were these guys who were motioning us in, calling us to come and find shelter in the midst of the storm. And I tell you that because every single person in this room deserves to have a few men or a few women who when you find yourself in the midst of a storm, every person deserves to have friends who are in a sense motioning you in to come and find shelter in your King, Jesus Christ. So it's really a question of do you have those people in your life? Because every person in this room deserves to have people in your life with whom it's okay to not be okay. Last week, we started a two-week series that we're calling Smiling Depression. That, that is a phrase in our culture today, which just simply means that you pretend like you're okay when you're really not. And I wonder if that just describes anyone in this room. If you're sitting there just saying, you know what, I'm good, I'm fine, life is okay. In reality, inside you're like, I'm not fine, I'm not good, and life's not okay. 
That's smiling depression. And so we, uh, we looked at Job in the scriptures last week, and this was a guy who dealt with massive storms in his life. This was a guy who lost his family in a tragic accident. He lost his business and his, he lost his health. The storms hit. And so this week, we're going to get introduced to Job's friends. And so if you've never really read through the book of Job, let me just tell you how it's set up. Chapters 1 and 2, the storms come. Uh, chapter 3, Job basically writes a song of depression because he's in the middle of the storm. And then chapters 4 through 31 are just this back and forth conversation between Job and his friends. Now, in verse or in chapter 16, verse 2, Job kind of gives us an indication about how he feels about his friends. Here's what he says. To his friends, his three friends, he says, I've heard many things like these. You are miserable comforters, all of you. So he's basically saying, let me just beg each of you, please don't grow up and be a professional counselor because our world does not need more of you. You guys are lousy at this. I'm struggling. I'm in the midst of the storm, and what you guys have given me is not good counsel. I don't know where you did your training, but that place should shut down. So Job just gives us some insight. He finds himself in the midst of the storm, and he's looking around saying, I don't have the right people in my life. I don't have people motioning me in to take shelter in the midst of the storm. And so this is a good opportunity for us to just evaluate because what I'm gonna, gonna do is I'm gonna give you four realities to a good friend in the midst of the storm. And so if you're in the midst of the storm, I'm gonna help you evaluate if you have the right people in your life. And if you're not in the midst of the storm, I'm gonna help you evaluate if you're being the right friend to other people who are in the midst of a storm. So if you have a Bible, I want you to turn with me this morning to Job chapter two. Job chapter two is where we're gonna be. The book of Job uh, gives three verses to what Job's friends did well, and then it gives 27 chapters to what they did wrong. Okay, so uh, I am gonna zero in on what they did well. I'm gonna give you three points from three verses, and I'm gonna give you one point from 27 chapters. You only really need one point to know just how royally they uh, messed up as friends. So uh, here we go, Job chapter two, verses 11 through 13. It says this. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place. These are great names to name your kids. Uh, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namathite, they made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him, and they raised their voices and wept. And they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads towards heaven. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very Great, so I'm gonna give you four realities of a good friend in the storm. The first reality of a good friend in the storm is this, a good friend knows what's going on. Very simple, and let me just be clear, the four points I'm gonna give you are very simple to say, but they take a lot of intentionality to live out. So if you're listening, you're like, man, this is easy, I know this. You need to evaluate, are you actually living it out? Because if you know it, but you're not living it, what's the point? Okay, that's too convicting. Sorry, we're too early into this thing for conviction. My bad. Anyway, a good friend knows what's going on. Think about it. These guys were positioned in such a way in Job's life that they got word when Job wasn't doing well. It's a good question to ask yourself. Have you positioned yourself in such a way in people's lives for you to get the call when things aren't going well? What I'm really asking you is, have you done a good job caring for your friends in such a way that when life goes south, when the storms roll in, you're the one that people call? I love what it says about Job's friends. It says that they first heard what was going on, and then as they got nearer to Job, they saw what was going on in his life. 
So they heard and they saw the trouble that Job was in. And it just kind of begs the question, do you have ears to hear and do you have eyes to see when those around you are struggling in life? And the reason that I even bring this up is because the busier we get, the more self-focused we get. When we become so confused Assumed with what we have going on in our own lives, it becomes very difficult to see what other people have going on in their lives. But this is the reality. Either you are feeling down, depressed, suicidal, stressed, or anxious, or someone you know most certainly is. And so the question is, is have you positioned yourself in a way with your friends to get the call? Do you have ears to hear and eyes to see what's going on in, in people's lives? I just want you to think about the people in your life right now. If someone is always dragging or is aloof or not wanting to hang out with anyone, or they're gaining a lot of weight or losing a lot of weight or drinking more or indulging in sin more or just not seeming them, themselves, do not take that lightly. If you're identifying that, then God is giving you the eyes to see or the ears to hear that something is not right in someone's life. And so let me just say this, today or tomorrow, I guarantee you, you're gonna have a conversation that goes like this. Hey man, how's you, how are you doing? Hey, how was your weekend? Good. That's the only answer to that question, right? We talked about that last week. No one answers that question, honestly. No one's like, man, thank you for asking. I'm on the edge. No one's real. I'm good. I just want to invite you to press into that answer a little. Like, that's what good friends will do. A good friend will just say, hey, man, thank you for that. Let me just ask you, are you really good or are you just telling me that? Like, I remember I was on the phone with my friend Drew. He asked me the question, hey, how are things going? And I put a positive spin on everything. I was like, well, we're doing good here, and my kids are doing this, and my wife, we're, like, things are good. And he's like, T.A., Hey, man, uh, are you really good or are you just telling me that? And I was like, oh, thank you so much for asking. I'm not good, man. Like, life is not going that well. I'm struggling. And it was so refreshing to just have someone, in a sense, say, hey, man, I love you enough to just ask. Are you really good? Because if you are, awesome. I'll celebrate that. But if you're not, let's talk because I want you to know that I love you and I care about how you're doing. Ask someone this, what in your life is not okay right now? Like at lunch tomorrow, ask someone that question, hey, what's not okay in life right now? Is there anything going on that I need to know about so I can ask God to help you with it? If someone opens up, ask them this, who else knows how you've been feeling? That'll give you an indication if someone's walking in isolation and you're the only one who now knows. What about this? How do you cope with how you've been feeling? Are there any unhealthy or harmful ways that you have been coping with how you feel? That's a huge one. Because that'll tell you if people are pacifying their pain in such a way that it's actually going to magnify their pain. And then if things get pretty serious and you sense that someone is really down and struggling, ask them this question, have you thought about taking your life? I've asked that question to students often. Have you thought about taking your life? If they say yes, ask them, do you have a plan to take your life? Have you chosen a time to take your life? Good friends know what's going on. And let me just say this. If someone, if you're in the midst of the storms of life and someone has the courage to ask you real questions like this, they deserve an honest answer. If they have the courage to press in on your life, you know what they're saying? They're saying, I love you enough to ask. I am not okay just letting you slip by if there's a chance that things aren't good. So I love you and I'm gonna ask what's going on. If someone has the courage to press in like that, they deserve an honest answer. And you will be better off for it. A good friend knows what's going on. The second reality of a good friend in the midst of the storm is this. A good friend takes action. A good friend takes action. I don't know if you saw the different phrases in Job chapter two, verses 11 through 13, but this shows how his friends took action. It says that they came each from his own place. They made an appointment together. They raised their voices and wept. They tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. They sat with Job on the ground. Seven days, Job's friends took action. 
And I'll just say this, I am so glad that men have taken action in my life, in my past. I think about when I graduated college, I kind of reached what I would consider a rock bottom moment in my life, and I was in the swimming in the midst of unnecessary pain. Storms came into my life because of some decisions that I had personally made. Regardless, they were storms that hit. And I had some friends, some, some men close to me who really just took action in my life. My parents loved me. They put me on a plane so I could just get out of the country and clear my mind for a little bit. And while I was out of the country, I had friends who were calling me and emailing me to speak truth into my life and pray with me and encourage me. And then when I came back, some friends just invited me to come and live with them for $200 a month. They just said, man, we want to be by you. We want to be around you. We want to encourage you. We want to speak truth into your life. We started a Bible study in our apartment so that we could just encourage one another with the truth. These guys fought for me. So I wouldn't slip back into some of the decisions that had put me where I was. Good friends take action. And so I just want to get really practical right now and encourage you, if you want to be a good friend to someone who's in the midst of the storm, I just want to encourage you to take action in some really practical ways. Number one, never assume and never minimize. Never assume that someone's fine when they're really not. Never assume that they're going to find the help that they need on their own. Never assume that they have everything that they need mentally to cope with what's going on in their life. Never assume. And then also never minimize what someone is going through in their life. And I'll just say this, and I am a parent, I'm just saying it to parents One of the things that I hear from students who are considering taking their lives, if I ask them, do your parents know what you're struggling with? Do you know what I hear often? What I hear is, I don't think they would understand. And I fire back and I'm like, no, they they will understand. Your parents would want to know that this is going on. But when I say that, there's always this 1% doubt in me that I'm like, "What what if their parents won't? understand. Because there's this very, very small 1% minority of parents who will say, you know what, I don't know why you're stressing about that. I don't know why you're feeling so down when your life is going so well. Look at everything that you have going well for you. Why are you stressing out about this? Why are you anxious about this? You just need to pull yourself up and be happy in life. Never minimize what people are feeling. Those aren't your feelings, it's their feelings, and their feelings are real. Never minimize someone's pain. Don't look at them and say, well, what you're experiencing on the grand scheme of things is small in comparison to what other people are going through. No, their pain is their pain, and it is real for them, and it's a big thing for them. So if someone is dealing with something, it doesn't matter how small or big you think it is. Don't minimize it. Take action. Let me encourage you with this. Instead of praying for your friends who are in the storm, pray with your friends who are in the storm. It's a big difference. It's great to pray for them. It's even better to pray with them. How great is it when you get to hear someone literally talking to the God of the universe on your behalf? And that really helps us out anyway because how often have you promise to pray for someone and then you forget to do it. So it's just better if someone says, hey, pray for me, I've got this going on. Say, let me pray for you right now. And just pray with them. I promise you it'll be a blessing to them and it'll be a blessing to you. When you sit with God and you open up this book and you're spending time with him, I encourage you, ask God, say, God, is there any truth from your word that you would have me share with this person? And if God puts a verse on your mind, uh, call the person, don't text them. Now lean into direct communication, people. Like call them and say, I was talking to God. And I asked him if he would have me share anything with you. And I think he brought this verse to mind. So I just wanted to read it to you. I know you're busy, but I'm going to read it and pray for you. And then I'll let you go about your day. Surround them with community. Be present in their lives. Don't let them be alone. Take action. At the same time, let me just say this. Part of being a good friend to someone is knowing your limits. Like if you're if you're not a professional counselor and you're not a medical professional, it's good to know that. (laughs) Like, it's good for you to be aware that you're not. 
then you don't feel the responsibilities of a professional counselor or a medical professional. Like there's times where I'm sitting with students where I just have to tell them, I say, hey, look, let me just be honest with you. I'm not a professional counselor and I'm not a medical professional. So I don't know exactly the best way to counsel you, but I tell you what, I can point you to some people who can. And so one of the best things you can do is just being good at knowing what you don't know and being willing to say, look, I don't know the best thing for you in this moment, but I would love to help you find someone who can really help you process through this. And then I'll say this, part of being a good friend in really extreme circumstances is being willing to jeopardize your friendship for the sake of someone's health. Because a lot of times when someone's contemplating taking their own life, they don't want anyone to know about it. And that's just not okay. And so there might be some extreme circumstances where you're willing to put your friendship on the line and you drive them to the hospital or you call the police and invite them into that situation for the sake of their, that person's well-being. I'll just say this um, before I move on. Um, it, it's interesting what it says about Job's friends. It says that uh, they came and sat with him for seven days and seven nights. Do you know what that means? It means Job became their schedule. Everything else they had planned. I don't know if they had to go to work that week, but it's like, I won't be at work. I'll be sitting on the ground with my friend for the next seven days. So if you need me, I won't be available. Job became their schedule. And I just simply tell you that to say, you know what? To be a good friend to someone in the storm, it's going to require a sacrifice. It will require you to sacrifice your time, your desires, your comfort in order to step into whatever someone's dealing with. So just be prepared for that and be willing to do that. The third reality of a good friend in the storm is this, a good friend is slow to speak. A good friend is slow to speak. Did you see what it said about Job's friends? Let me just read it again. They sat with him on the ground, verse, 12, verse 13. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights and no one spoke a word to him. No one spoke for seven days. Some of you are like, that is like a dream come true. <laughs> Others of you are like, I would die. But his friends were slow to speak. Do you know when Job's friends got themselves into trouble? You know when it was? When they opened their mouths. When they started talking, that's when everything began to go downhill for them. I, I'll just say for me personally, this is convicting because just in what I do, there are times where I'm sitting with people where they are looking to me for the right answer or they're looking to me for a word of encouragement or inspiration. And there have been times where I've sat with people and out of this feeling like I need to meet some expectation, I have tried to force something that doesn't belong. And there's been times where in my wording, I've tried to simplify something that's really complex, or I've tried to make sense of something that makes no sense. So I just want to encourage you, don't ever underestimate the power of just being present. And there's a lot of power in sitting with someone and just saying, look, I just want you to know, I don't know the right thing to say here. I, I, don't, I can't begin to imagine what you're going through, and I don't have the right words for this moment, but I'll just tell you this, I love you, and I'm with you, I'm not going anywhere, and I'll be here as long as you need me. Don't es underestimate the power of that. Because the reality is a lot of people find themselves in situations that make no sense. And so it would be foolish for us to try and make sense of them. There are situations that have no answer this side of eternity. So let's not try and give explanations that really are not appropriate. A good friend is, is slow to speak. So let me encourage you with this. Like, let, let's just be clear. I, I hope that this place doesn't fall mute. Like now no one's like, he told me not to talk. Okay, so now I don't know, man, good luck with that. Like that's not what I'm saying. Like God uses his people to lift up and encourage his people. So we need to be an encouragement to each other. We need to go to battle for each other. We need to speak truth into people's lives. But let me just say this. Here's the best way to proceed. You need to make sure that you are responding to God, not reacting to someone's pain. 
There's a big difference between responding to God and just reacting to someone's pain. Our tendency is to react to people's pain because when someone's in pain, we wanna help them find relief from their pain, especially as parents, if our kids are suffering or struggling with pain, we wanna remove them from it as quickly as possible. Our goal often is to shorten people's valleys. But when we react to people's pain, a lot of times we can say things that just will ultimately bring more pain into their lives. Like, let me get real practical with you. If someone's going through a breakup or going through a divorce, what they don't need is you to pour gasoline on the fire of their anger and bitterness. The worst thing you can do is sit with someone and talk about how terrible their ex-wife or ex-husband was. They have plenty of fuel for the fire of their bitterness. They don't need your gasoline. And the answer for their hurt in their heartbreak is not to rebound and say, now you're freed up to find someone who will be better. That's not what they need most in that moment. And they don't need you to open a bottle so that you guys can sit there and numb the pain with alcohol. That is not what is needed most. That's reacting to their pain. And let me tell you this, don't assume what God's doing. Let me just encourage you, please don't assume what God is doing. Don't make promises that you don't know that God will keep in the sense that, you know what? You don't know what God is doing. So don't sit there and be like, God's gonna bring y'all back together. God's gonna restore your relationship. He's going to move you towards health. God's gonna heal your cancer. He's gonna take care of your mom. He's gonna heal your dad. You don't know that. You don't know what God's gonna do. You can hope with that person. You can pray with that person. You can pray expectantly with that person. But in the end, we don't know what God's gonna do. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So it'd be foolish for us to assume that we know. A good rule to live by is simply this. Before you talk to your friend, talk to God. Or just wait. I would just say, just watch how much of a blessing you can be when if you're talking to someone, you're talking to God at the same time, just asking God, God, do you want to download something to me right now that you want me to share with this person? And if God brings something to mind, share it, and I promise you, it will be a blessing to people, especially if you're just speaking the truth from the word of God to them. I'll just give you an example from my own life. Uh, Not too long ago, I was talking to a girl who wanted to take her life like she basically sent me her suicide note. And so I found myself uh, with, this, with this girl and a couple other breakaway staff members. We went to be where she was. And here's what she told me. She just said, I just wanna go and be with Jesus. I wanna leave this earth and I wanna go and be with Jesus. And I was like, look, you're, you're really struggling right now. You are, you're, you're hurting right now. And so I understand what you're saying that You'd rather go and be with Jesus? That's probably better, honestly. It it probably feels better to be with Jesus than to be here right now. But as I was talking to her, I was talking to God and just asking God, is there anything you want me to share with her? And as I was standing there talking with her, God put Philippians chapter one in my mind. Haven't thought about this passage in a few months or a few years. I don't know when the last time was I thought about this verse, and it came to mind, I pulled out my phone, and here's what I read to her. I said, I said, I just want you to see what Paul is saying. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians 1, 21 through 24, knowing that you're sitting here saying, I'd rather go and be with Jesus than be here. Here's what Paul says. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. I just said to live is Christ. Jesus wants you to live. He doesn't want you to die. That's why you still have breath in your lungs. So for you to live is Christ. To die is gain, I get it. But to live is Christ. And it was an encouragement to her in that moment. A good friend is slow to speak. Then the fourth reality of a good friend is this, a good friend has good theology. A good friend has good theology. These three friends of Job, they wanted to be a source of comfort and instead they were a massive source of pain. Let me just share with you some of the things that these three guys shared with Job. This was their encouragement to him. First, you got Eliphaz. Eliphaz in Job 22.5 says this, is not your evil abundant? There's no end to your iniquities. 
He's like, Job, the reason all this is happening is because you're a failure in life. Your life is one massive moral failure. Clearly, you are a broken, busted, jacked up person. And God's like, okay, if you're just going to sin royally, then I'm going to punish you royally. That's what's happening in your life, Job. It's all on you, and it's because you are rebelling significantly against God. So that's Eliphaz. Now, Bildad. Bildad says this in Job 8. He says, if you will see God and plead with the Almighty for mercy, if you're pure and upright, surely then he will rouse himself for you and restore your rightful habitation. And though your beginning was small, your latter days will be very great. You know what he's saying? He's saying, Job, get your life together. If you will live a better life, then God will give you a better life. If you do good, you're going to get good. God's going to Um, shine on you with prosperity. The storms are going to roll away. The sun's going to come out in your life and it's going to shine brightly over all of your future and you're going to have a lot of prosperity. So do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. You're doing bad, so you're getting bad. But do good and you're going to get good. And then you got Zophar who shows up in Job 11. Here's what he says. He says to Job, he says, for you say my doctrine is pure and I'm clean in God's eyes. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips to you and that he would tell you the secrets of wisdom for he is manifold in understanding. You're hearing that and you're like, amen, so far. He is manifold in understanding. Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. You know, he's saying, he's saying, God's going easy on you, Job. The fact that you lost all your loved ones and you lost your business and you lost your health, you're lucky. You should thank God that he didn't do more because you actually deserve more. These awesome friends, don't you wish you had friends who are like, you know what? God should split the earth in half and swallow you up, but he hasn't. (laughs) It's God's grace in your life. You hit your knees and you thank him right now. (laughs) Lousy friends. And God looks at these guys in Job 42 and listen to what God says. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right. Can you feel the weight of the God of the universe looking at these guys who thought they were speaking in the name of the Lord and God's like, you weren't speaking for me. My anger burns against you. May that never be true of us that God would look at us and say, you have not spoken what is right of me. See, good friends have good theology. And this is really important because what is the question that always comes up when someone's in the storm? What's the question that they ask? Why? Why is this happening to me? What's the answer? I don't know. That's the right answer to that question. We don't know. We don't know exactly what's God, what God is doing. So let's focus on what we do know. Here's what we do know. Number one, it is good to know that sin can be the cause of pain. It can be. That's why James says in James 5.16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Sin is sometimes the cause of pain. But this doesn't mean that you go on a witch hunt in the lives of your friends. Don't go to them and be like, are you looking at porn? Because that might explain why this storm's going on in your life. I don't know if you're doing that, but I just need to check because you're probably screwing up somewhere. That's probably not the right way to go. At the same time, you might have some friends in your life that are struggling and you can look into their lives and it's just very evident that the life that they're living is not honoring to the Lord and they're experiencing the consequences because of it. And so in those instances where it's very obvious and abundantly clear, then you go to them and just say, look, let me just be honest with you. I do think that there's some things in your life that are actually causing unnecessary pain in your life. And I think if you take a step towards repentance, there might be healing waiting around that door. Next thing, it's good for us to just be clear on, bad things will happen to God's people, period. Bad things will happen to God's people. God is not a God of karma where he says, you know what, do good, I'm gonna give you good. 
I mean, Jesus tells us in John 16, 33, what does he say? He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Listen to his words, his exact words. It's like he gathers his friends around. He's like, I need you all eyes on me. Please don't miss this. What does he say? In this world, you will have trouble, period. He doesn't say, in this world, you, you, and you, you're going to have trouble. The rest of you, you're going to be fine. He doesn't say, in this world, you might have trouble. In this world, some of you, it might not go that well, but the rest of you, you're going to crush it. No, he says, in this world, you will have trouble. And yet, when the storms hit, we're like, Jesus, where were you? What are you doing? He's like, I told you. In this world, you will have trouble. Don't expect your best life now in a world that is busted and broken by sin. Next, it's just clear for us to know God is with you. Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. It's just good for us to be able to reassure people, hey, God is with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. And his presence isn't a feeling, it's just a fact. You might not be able to sense God is with you, but it doesn't change the fact that he is with you. Next, God is doing something. A lot of times we're like, God, why don't you do something? I think God's like, I am doing something. Just because you can't see God doing something doesn't mean God's not doing something. I mean, listen to what Paul says in Romans 5. He says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. What this means is with God, pain is never pointless. God takes pain, and he he uses it. He takes pain that seems pointless, and he actually makes it productive. He never wastes hurt. But you need to know, just because you can't see God doing something doesn't mean he's not doing something. And then it's good for us to know God already did something. He already did something. When God sent his son, Jesus Christ, and when Jesus Christ voluntarily got up on that cross and was punished for your sins and mine, Jesus Christ endured a storm that no one else in all of history will ever endure. It was the storm of the wrath of God being poured out on him for your sin and for mine. What that means is Jesus knows where you are. He has been where you've been. He's experienced what you've experienced. But when he went to that cross, he was making payment for your sin and for mine. And he was put in a tomb and on the third day he walked out of it victoriously. His resurrection is a declaration that Satan's sin and death have been conquered. It's not that they will one day be conquered, it's that they have been conquered. Satan, sin, and death are on the clock, and a day is coming where Jesus is going to make all things new, and Satan, sin, and death will be dealt with once and for all, and Jesus' victory will be realized throughout the earth. That's why Paul is able to say in 1 Corinthians 15, behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. This perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ went to the cross. He's already dealt with Satan, sin, and death, and a day is coming where his victory over those things will be realized throughout the earth. Do you know what that means? It means that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, this world is the closest you will ever get to hell. It means that cancer can put a believer in the ground, but it can't keep them there. It means a disability can keep a believer from running or walking here on this earth, but it can't keep them from running and beholding the God of the universe, for all of eternity. A day is coming where the statement will be true. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Jesus has already done something, and he's done something, but he's still going to do something. So just take heart, because a day is coming where this perishable body will put on the imperishable, this mortal body will put on immortality. But you need to have good theology. So for example, 
uh, one of my friends found out that he, uh, he had an aggressive form of cancer at the age of 40. And uh, he was in College Station one day, friend from college, and he called me up and just said, hey, can I stop by your house? Would you pray for me? So he came over and we were sitting there and he just said, hey, uh, do you think it's wrong for me to pray that God would heal me? I said, no, that's a great prayer to pray. You absolutely should pray that God would heal you, but you need to know, we already know the answer to that prayer. The answer is yes, God will heal you. We just don't know which side of eternity it will be on. And uh, my friend went to be with the Lord at the age of 40, right at the beginning of the summer. You know what the good news is? God answered his prayer, and he's permanently healed from his cancer for all of eternity. Good friends have to have good theology, though. And so I'll just say this. You know what the beauty is of the gospel? The beauty of the gospel is that Jesus Christ has gone to the cross so that we wouldn't have to. Jesus Christ has been punished so that we wouldn't have to be punished. Jesus has come to bring us near to God so that we can have a shelter in the midst of the storm. But one of the most beautiful realities of the gospel is this. We who were children of wrath have become children of God because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. That's what Jesus has accomplished is he has made a way for us into the family of God. So he hasn't just saved you from your sin. He has saved you into a community, a family of brothers and sisters. You know what that means? It means that no follower of Jesus Christ should ever have to shiver alone in the cold times of life. A follower of Jesus Christ should never have to sit in the rain or the hail of life on their own. Every single person deserves to have a few men or a few women who are in a sense motioning them in to take shelter in the shadow of their king, Jesus Christ. And so I'm just going to end by reading a list of names. John Paul Holt, John Harrington, Andy Davenport, Blair Browning, Brian Mountjoy, Sterling Worth, Brian Fisher, Jeff Johnson. To you, these are just random names. To me, these guys are lifelines. To my shelter, Jesus Christ. These are men who throughout my life have stood Have they seen me in the hailstorms of my life? They have motioned me in, pointing me to the shelter that's found in the grace of our God. And God has used them to help me find hope and healing in the midst of the most disappointing, depressing times in life. So let me just ask you, if you're in the storms of life, do you have the right people in your life? If the answer is no, this is a great place to start. And if you're not in the midst of the storms, Can you identify someone who is? And if you can, won't you be the friend that God has called you to be in their lives? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you know where every single person in this room is at. You know who's really not fine and really not good and really not okay. But I thank you that you have them here today. I thank you that you have us together. That this is really just a a weekly family reunion where we as brothers and sisters get to come and be together. So no one has to shiver alone. No one has to endure the hailstorms of life alone, God. This may today even be just me waving people in to find you as their shelter. God, may we be good friends to each other. May we care for people. Would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear those who are hurting in our lives, Lord God. I pray that you would give us wisdom in how to take action. And I pray that we would always talk to you before we speak to others, God. May we respond to you instead of just react to other people's pain. And Lord, may we know your word. May we have good theology, Lord. We're grateful, God, that there is always hope and healing to be found in you, God. In you, God, are a refuge. You are a shelter. You are an ever-present help in times of trouble. But we need you, God, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.